At what point, Martin, should we outwardly disobey the government so as to obey God? Yeah, that's, well, I got a lot of heat from this for those of you who follow my Facebook page. Um, Look, let's get one thing very clear. Civil disobedience, which is breaking the law, so it's not advocating on issues, it's not giving feedback to your politicians, it's it's a different thing. Actually breaking the law, doing something illegal, doing something criminal, doing something you get in trouble for with the police, that is not a feature of Christianity on the whole throughout history. Scripture's really, there's only two commands in all of Scripture that are very clearly given to us specifically and directly in relation to government. One is pray for them. I think if we believed in that, we'd be more comfortable with the second one, which is submit to them and honour them. The example, look, there's two things. I mean, the very fact that that was written to people, a Christian church living under Roman oppression is significant in itself. Um, because they were often Jewish converts as well, and they had a history of being real troublemakers. Uh, I mean, Simon was a zealot, right? Um, it was, you know, pretty, they are practically terrorists. Uh, but also you had the Maccabean Rebellion and all this kind of stuff in their history, and the Romans found them notoriously hard to control. And the Apostle Paul writes to them and says, he actually says, there's no authority except that which comes from God. Therefore, honour the ordinance of God and submit to governing authority. It's not just Paul, it's also written in 1 Peter 2, very similar things. He talks about governors sent by God, he says, honour the king, he says, submit to them, he says the same thing. And Jesus also gave two great examples on this. One of the examples he gave was they came to him and said, do we have to pay the tribute money, which is like a temple tax? Uh, And he actually makes the point that, oh, well, actually, uh, you're not citizens of the world and bound in the same way um, as as people, uh, you know, in in a theological sense, but he says, so as not to cause offence, you go and do it. You go and do it. He says, go find a fish, get the money, go and pay the tax. And then he gets challenged uh, about, you know, uh, uh, the the coin, uh, and he says, they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God's what is God's. One of the big mistakes people make is they take that one, because it's the opportunity in all of them for civil disobedience, right? And they say, well, what Caesar's? Well, nothing, right? It all belongs to God. Uh, it's like, well, yeah, that's handy, that's true. Um, but actually, what belongs to Caesar is his place as a governing authority under God. And Jesus said to Pilate, he said, you would have no authority at all unless it were given to you from above. But at the same time, he acknowledged the legitimacy of that authority. And he actually said, so greater is the sin of the one who handed me over to you. In other words, he's got a legitimate exercise of authority here, and the greatest thing is with those who handed him over to the authority. So, respect for authority, submission to governing authorities, is a Christian virtue. We are not anarchists, we are not lawbreakers, we are not rebellious, we are not responsible for chaos. That is not Christian. And in fact, all through the Scriptures, the notion of submission is very strong. Uh, And I do worry sometimes that we've made rights into an idol Uh, and basically we say, yeah, but I've got rights. You hear this very often from American audiences where they say, but the Constitution says, and you go, well, it's not the 67th book of the Bible, right? (laughs) Actually, God says. And so, civil disobedience at at a basic level generally is not part of Christian life, okay? And we've got to live with that. Uh, And look, if God doesn't ask for your help with something, He doesn't need it, okay? If He says submit when you don't want to submit, well, He doesn't need your help. And we've got to believe that He says that He allows authorities. We've got to believe that. We've got to believe that He says pray for them and things will change. We've got to believe that and do what we're told, if you like. Now, of course, there's limits. The obvious limit is when the authorities tell you to do something which is a sin. Don't do it. Uh, If the authorities get in the way of your relationship to God and want you to either fail to act or act in a way that is disobedient to God, don't do it. Uh, And it's very often the case that you, so for example, the conversion therapy law in Victoria, okay? I'm not saying go out and do conversion therapy, what I am saying 
is that there's a section in there that says if you pray for someone because they ask you to, because they want your prayers for them because of their gender dysphoria or their sexual identity, and you pray for them, you could go to jail. I'm saying live as though that law doesn't exist, because you should pray for them. Or if you can't preach the whole counsel of God as a church leader, because you can't get to Romans 1 and say what God says about these issues because of the conversion therapy law, well, too bad, you've got to say it, live as though the law doesn't exist in that circumstance. So there are laws in this country already that Christians are duty-bound not to keep, but on the whole that is not true Um, and I think this is really coming to a head over the pandemic stuff and I'm sorry, my conscience is held captive by what the Word of God says and it's very clear. Uh, We've just got to hold our fire and wait. Uh, There are circumstances where it gets so bad that there's sort of a rebellion scenario, we're not there, we're not there and maybe I'll I'll, I'll do the theology on that one when I get there. (laughs) Um, Would you be willing to comment on the most difficult challenge to yet face the Christian community? What is it and what can we do? The most, I hate these questions because it's like the most, you know? And you just sit there, start sweating, thinking, what if I don't say the most? What if I don't say the worst? (laughs) The biggest challenge facing the Christian community. Really hard to know. Um... Look, possibly, um, I think increasingly, like, there's two things, I mean, one is, um, one is discerning what is light and what is dark, what is true and what is false, in the quickly changing, rapidly changing world in which we live. Um, I think that's a really big one, Uh, certainly that's what I've figured out doing the sort of stuff that I do, when you talk about modern movements, modern cultural things like identity politics or cultural Marxism or, you know, uh, you know, there's this whole swirling array of ideas that are out there Um, and I think that the Bible, when it talks about worldliness, it actually is talking, we used to think that meant smoking cigarettes and going to the movies. What it probably (laughs) means is taking on the world's way of thinking Um, and so, the biggest challenge for the church is probably the renewal of the mind, uh, as Romans 12, 1 says, to be, you know, transformed, not conformed by all that thinking in the world. Um, but I think today, the challenge is to have the courage not to be conformed to this world. Because I think a lot of people do conform, a lot of people do accept bad ideas, because they want, they don't have the courage to be disliked to stand against things that are bad. They don't have the courage to be the one that's going against the tide, against the stream. They don't have the courage to be the person who stands out, to be the Daniel, who's the loser in the corner, who won't eat the food. You know, come on, man. Uh, (laughs) People need the courage not to be conformed. That's probably one of the biggest things uh, at the moment. Um, There's others, but that'll do. These issues, so the issues that you've just talked about, seem simple on the basis of Christian principle, but people are not principles. How does empathy and compassion connect with these principles? Um, I, I think one of the really, there's a couple of important points to bear in mind. Um, One is, um, when you speak about principles, um, depends on, you know, you're going to say it a little differently for different audiences, right? So, you can always go hard with a Christian audience. You've got to bear in mind where other people are at, always. And one of the great errors we make is we don't always understand where other people are at. And if you want to learn from the master of understanding where other people are at, meeting them there and drawing them forwards, it's Jesus. You read his interactions with people, how that he just read them, he just knew where they were and he met them there all the time. You know, the woman he met her at the well, there's even a physical aspect to that. Uh, And then he started the conversation and he got into her, where's your husband and so on. And he just pressed the buttons and was able to lead somebody to, to, to speak very important that we are people uh, who are sensitive to that. Now, the way you'll get better at that is if your concern actually, your motive, we talked about motive with the hate speech section, motive matters in a lot of ways and one of the ways it matters is that your motive must always be for the other person. 
A lot of people go into debate to be right, to have an argument. A lot of people go into debate with a self-righteousness that makes them easily upset and offended. Read this on Facebook all the time, they're abusing each other within two comments. You know, it goes, it goes south real quick. Um, you've got to make sure that you're not there for yourself. It's really, really important. And if you're not there for yourself, and if you've got them in your mind's eye as you're speaking, a lot of people make comments online without thinking of who might read it. Well, picture them in your brain if you're not speaking to them personally. And if your motive is for the person, if your motive is to help the person understand, if your motive is to bring some blessing to the person, some light to the person, some revelation to the person, and you're not there for yourself at all, but you've only got them and God in your thinking, you'll do a lot better at it, a lot better at it. It's been a real lesson for me um, and it's, it's something I've had to put into practice in very challenging environments. Uh, where well, you go in there effectively and, you know, you know you could be torn to shreds, but what are you thinking about when you're there? You're thinking, how can I shed some light, share some truth? That should never stop you from being convictional and straight to the point, though. It's just that when you are, your tone will be affected by your motive. Um, and so, do tell the truth. People want to hear it, they want to be straight. Uh, but if you are there for the right reason, your motive will be reflected in the way you speak, quite involuntarily. A lot of people out there at the moment, they say, oh, you know, manage your tone, this is how you should talk. Forget all that. Uh, get your motive right and the rest will fall into place. The human heart is radically corrupt. You're at the top of an organisation. Opportunities exist to exercise power in sinful ways. How do you not fail? Yeah, look, I, this is one of the real tragedies of our... I mean, a real... And it, it alarms me as much as anyone. An absolute tragedy of our time is that, it's, you know, we, we've got Christian leaders dropping like flies. Um, it's just so sad. Mm. Um, and, you know, it gives me incredible respect for, for a number of men who are... Most of them are now dead, actually... Uh, some of them are still alive, but who influenced me growing up through MP3s and videos and all the rest of it from all around the world. And I look at them and I think, wow, you've held it together. You know, you're blameless right to the end. Uh, and it gives me such, you know, I really respect those people all the more. Look, I would say a couple of things. Um, the first thing is, if you're worried about people like me, pray for us. Um, and I, I don't mean that flippantly, uh, I, I just mean that it is, uh, I am absolutely convinced that so much of the good things that have happened, all the good things that have happened in the last few years, I mean, I don't feel like I did any of it, I just feel like it happened. Uh, God opened the doors, He threw them open. Uh, and at every step of the way, you think, well, I can't do this, but you can, you, because God gives you the grace if you're supposed to. Um, and so, the, the, the care of God over things that are done in His name and of Himself is enormous. So, I'd say pray for people like me, if that's your concern. Um, the other thing is, I, I really do think it's... Look, there's, there's, I won't go into this, but you have a lot of experiences in your life that actually train you for things. Uh, people often find that the things that they do in life, they come to fruition, if you like, later in life. I think there was a lot of things that maybe trained me um, for this in a good way, which I, I won't go into all that. Um, but the final thing I was going to say is that a lot of it just comes back to little things. Um, a lot of it comes back to the disciplines of studying and reading the Word all the time. Uh, it comes back to making sure that wherever you are, you follow that discipline of going to church when you can, uh, you have somebody who prays for you, uh, you know, who you can text and who helps and who does that job. I'm grateful I've got a couple of people who are always available to pray and who I feel confident to actually send information to. It's these little things getting them right. Um, and the other thing is, you've got to have a couple, of a couple of people who know you really well uh, and speak to you often, give you godly counsel, you know, giants of faith uh, who know you well enough that when something's wrong, they're all about it. Uh, and for me, I'm very fortunate because that person is my dad. Uh, and that's, that's great. And so, it works out nicely. Uh, but those are just a few things. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the rest is, as far as you're concerned, pray. Um, Austin asks, with an increasingly liberal and politicised curriculum, 
What hope do you see in the future for school teachers who profess a faith in Christ? Thank it's you. a good... This is, these ones come up a bit, actually. I'm getting good at this one. Um, <laughs> I think, look, a lot of us... And this is feedback I get. This is what I say to the government. The number one thing I get, and, you know, a lot of the times I do meet and greet with slightly smaller audiences, and we talk to people and everything, and the thing that I get all the time is people saying, I'm under pressure at work. They say, you know, we've got this diversity training workshop, we've got this, this rainbow signature thing going on, we've got this, we've got that, we've got this, and I'm worried I'm going to get to a point where I can't in good conscience do something. Uh, or that someone's going to ask me a pointed question. Or I'm going to be asked to step into some area that I'm not comfortable with. Um, and the, peop the pressure, and there's some professions worse than others. School teaching is one. Um, uh, I've, got, I've, I've spoken to a couple of um, psychologists and, and, and youth counsellors who are the, in the same situation. Medical professionals, academics in highly, highly woke establishments like universities. Really, really under pressure. Um, it's a common feeling for Christians working in the secular environment. Um, look, the thing is, the best advice I can think of, and this, this, actually I have had experience with this when I was working in a big law firm, um, is firstly make sure that people know uh, about your convictions and your faith in peaceful times. Uh, so they're your friend on the basis that you're a Christian from the start. Uh, so just to reduce the likelihood that this all comes to a head in a conflict scenario. But also it's a good witness, it's what you ought to do, we're salt and light, right? Um, the second thing is, all of us know, like I don't think anyone should, you know, you might be made to walk the plank, but you shouldn't jump until you're pushed. So, don't be foolish, don't find trouble, don't make a mess for yourself. I don't think that's right, I don't think that's wise, I don't think that's being a good steward of the place God has put you. But I think we all know when we have a day or a moment where we're called on to make a choice, or where we're put under pressure. And all I can say is, dare to be a Daniel. You know, you can't plan your future better than God can. All you can do is do the right thing today and say, God's got tomorrow. And it's interesting, Daniel started his whole career that way when he was at the university in the king's household, one of the special young fellows, you know. Uh, and, you know, you'd be like, keep your head down, play the politics, man, you know, don't stick out too early, all this kind of stuff. And that's what he could have and should have and would have done if he wasn't bound, if he didn't feel that he had to serve God. And he made a decision right from the start. He thought, when my day of testing comes, I'm going to stand firm. And he had to do it multiple times. Now, did that compromise his career? Did that compromise his future? Certainly didn't. You know, God had the rest. Uh, and, you know, I've had an ugly experience in, in the law world. Um, and it's amazing. Well, in the long term, it didn't matter. At the time, it felt terrible. Uh, but in the long term, it didn't matter. And I think that's the best advice for a young person. You can't plan your future better than God can, so leave it in His hands. Honour Him first, and then watch for Him to take care of the rest. There's many people with testimonies that will tell you that that is how life works. And increasingly, in a cancel culture age, increasingly in an age of pressure, um, we're going to be more reliant on God and less on ourselves, and that's not a bad thing. Um, what is critical race theory... And is it bad? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's bad. Um, <laughs> look, there's a whole lot of critical theories, actually. Um, it's interesting, one of the things about these critical theories is all they can do is criticise. They don't actually have anything to replace it with. Uh, they're just designed to tear down and destroy. Um, that's all it is. They create chaos, they create division, they create resentment, they create anger, they destroy things, they break things down, and then there's nothing left. There's just, well, actually, because it's, it's all pushed by cultural Marxists and so they think there's going to be the utopian rebellion at the end of it. I don't know how. Um, but that's, that's the fruit of these things. And it reminds me of Galatians, is it 6, where it talks about, yeah, you've got the fruit of the Spirit, then you've got the fruits of the, 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 the works of the flesh. And it talks about dissensions, strifes, envyings, jealousy, anger, riot. It, it talks about all the things that these theories create. And I just think they're coming from a bad, bad, bad place. But what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is the idea that racism is not about overt acts of racism, but that racism is everything. Everything is built and designed and created from a standpoint of white supremacy, and therefore everybody who is not white in, that, in the system, in all the social conditions of our day, is oppressed. 
the way we do maths is white supremacist and racist. The way we design our furniture is white supremacist and racist. The way we choose people for jobs is white supremacist and racist because if people are white, every decision they make centres their whiteness and it comes from a position of white supremacy and that's all they can do and there is no way out. That is, on, read Robin DeAngelo's White Fragility, that is quite seriously what critical race theory says. I'm not even caricaturing it, it's what it says. Um, now, look, this is a deeply anti-Christian idea because we're all human and we are all capable of loving our neighbour and we're all capable of loving our neighbour in the design that is given by God to love our neighbour. Uh, critical race theory says, no, whiteness is an irredeemable condition. And it's amazing to watch Robin DiAngelo. I mean, the, the prescription is tear it all down. And there's nothing after that. But it's amazing to see her get to the end of her book and I was hanging out saying, well, what's her solution? How do we fix it? What do we do? Give me an answer. She has no answer. She just says, we have to learn all the ways in which we're racist forever. Talk about a hopeless, <laughs> unforgiving, dead end. Um, you know, I'm just glad that in Christ, every tribe, tongue, people and nation. Uh, I'm just glad that in, that, that solves everything. Um, it's interesting, Dennis Prager, who's a Jew, uh, he says, uh, he speaks all the time around America and he says, the most successful multiracial environments on the planet, for a man who speaks in forums all week, every week, he says, are the churches I visit. And he said, that's where race suddenly doesn't matter. Uh, and that's actually a creation thing, this is, another, this is another attack on creation. Creation says, well, there's one human race. Actually, melanin in the skin is a completely trivial genetic difference. We are all one humanity. We're all equally offered salvation by God. We're all equally sanctified. We're all in all the stuff that matters. That's the greatest equality in the world. Martin, what do you do to keep your calm when you're asked questions aggressively or defensively that are emotional or virtue signaling? Um, three things, I think. I'll, go, I'll just mention three things that definitely play a part. But immediately I think of uh, preparation. So I never go into anything in a hostile environment without a solid degree of preparation. Uh, you, you really need to be ready. Uh, you need to work on it, you need to go through it, you need to... Uh, I've got a great team who, who, who prep me. Uh, that's the first thing. And, and you can't really over-prepare. Uh, you know, I went on Q&A, for example, and in total I probably spoke for like 10 minutes at most, which was more than any other panellist. Uh, but that goes like bang under pressure. You feel like you said a thing and it's over. But days of thought and workshopping go into the experience, so you're ready for anything. The second one is um, prayer. Um, and I don't mean that in a flippant way. I mean, you really have to be a person of prayer. Um, and uh, I have people, a lot of people who pray for me, uh, and I do my ut utmost best to continually commit everything to God that I'm doing in a day. The Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing. I don't think he meant necessarily that you stop and kneel down and pray, you know, over and over again in a day. I think he meant be prayerful all the time. Uh, commit things to God as you go. Um, so that's the second thing. The third thing is um, you do need, um, you need to watch your motive in these things. Um, there are a lot of people, uh, particularly in the political world, whose motive is victory, uh, whose motive is to make people look stupid, whose motive is yeah, to win, uh, whose motive is to tear down and destroy others. Uh, you've got to be very, very careful about all that. I think the way I finish my talk today is crucial. What's the motive? Well, ultimately, it's Christ. Finally, it is that people would see Christ through you, and finally, it is that you would get a chance to point people to Him. And that's why when I do go in very hostile environments, I think, well, ultimately, what am I here for? Well, I'm going to try and talk about the Gospel. Uh, and I've been very, very fortunate that time and again that opportunity has come to me. Um, but if your motive is right, and if you're not there to hate people, if you're not there to destroy people, if you're not there to prove yourself, to pump yourself up, to get an audience... I mean, a lot of people out there are clamouring to get screen time. Uh, I mean, it's the last thing I want, believe you me. Um, it's, just, it's just too stressful, <laughs> apart from anything else. Uh, but if your motive is right, it will be seen in you. And the person who really watches and really thinks and really listens will see it. 
Uh, and that's crucial for all of us. That's crucial for all of our engagements with people every day, actually. Would you encourage us to speak up on social media posts even when we are met with hate speech and Christ's name is slandered? And this is from Jeff, and he says, keep up the great work. So oh, thanks, nice. Jeff. Yeah. So what, what was the actual... Um, read so the start you, of the question yeah, again. Would you encourage us... You're still thinking I want to about answer the shampoo, now. aren't you? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> would you encourage us... Would you encourage us to speak up on social media posts ah. even when we're met with you know, hate speech and even when Christ's yeah, of name course. is... Of yeah. course. Do you know something? I have learned that the people who comment on social media aren't all the people, right? There's a certain kind of person, and I'm sorry if you're in the room, there's a certain kind of person who comments on social media to start with. I wasn't that person until I got this job. I was a stalker. Uh, people added me on Facebook and I was like, joke's on you. I'm not doing anything, but I'm watching you. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stalkers on Facebook, all right? And the vast majority of people you meet in a day are stalkers, okay? They have accounts, they don't do much with them. And if they do things with them, it's very personal. They don't go on my page and post. They don't go on public figure pages or public organisational pages and debate. There's a kind of person who does that, and look, more power to you, that's fine. It's a very frustrating thing to do, I'll tell you that. Um, just don't be put off, like I said at the end of my talk, by the noise. The noise is so distracting and it's a lie. The noise is not the main game. Uh, I'll tell you, when we have events like this and there's a protest, it is not the main game. It is not representative. Um, and we've just got to bear that in mind always. And I do have a... Look... <sighs> Gosh, this, this, these Q&As sometimes go up online. Um, but I do have a friend who, who posts things and he gets one criticism and he deletes it. And I'm like, oh, that's like what I said before, we're going to have to toughen up if we're going to be light and salt, you know. Because whilst that person, and I believe that some people just do the devil's work on this and they are there to goad and they are there to sow seeds of division on Facebook posts and, make, and discourage you, uh, I just ignore it. Honestly, I just absolutely ignore it uh, and just plough on. Uh, and look at the good that can come from it. I mean, you're all here tonight in Geraldton, so... Martin, this one's a really sad, and I can feel the sadness of this question. I'm going to try and get through two more questions. This one, Martin, have you listened to the journey of gays? Have you shared their agony of soul? Well, yeah, that's... Um, the way that question is worded is significant because I think it's true. Um, I have sat down with um, some people who have spoken in those terms um, and I totally appreciate the feelings uh, that they express and the agony that some of those people describe. And I have had very vivid descriptions from one gentleman in particular uh, of um, the fears he has and how he feels about uh, the existence of us and things like that. Uh, I, I, I know that, I see that. The reality is um, many people, for all manner of reasons in our world, are in agony of soul. Uh, that is the truth. There's that song by Steve Green, um, People Need the Lord. It talks about, you know, people filled with care, going who knows where, living fear to fear, and he describes the people passing him in the streets. Um, but, of course, the punchline is the point, isn't it? You know, the prophecy about Jesus was that a bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. And actually, one of the things that means that a person is on a journey to finding something, is agony of soul. Uh, the first beatitude, those to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs, is the poor in spirit. Uh, those who feel poverty in themselves. Uh, those uh, who, and those who are mourning, those who are sorrowing over it. Uh, and I always say these sorts of feelings are not... When a person experiences them, it's kind of a crossroads. Where am I going to go with it? Where's it going to take me? And the only correct answer that the world can possibly have is that Christ is the answer. Uh, and he has said, it's interesting, in Matthew 11, the only place where Jesus describes his personality, he says, uh, he says that he is meek 
and gentle. Now, meek means that he, is, he, he speaks basically of his submission and his, uh, his gentleness, and he's, he's talking basically about saying he is the most accessible person in the world to those who are weary and those who are heavy laden. And the tragedy, and I will say this, the tragedy of the LGBT movement is that they trap people in that, in that life. And I'm here to tell you Jesus is the answer. And there's many of us who have had agony of soul over different things, but Jesus really is the answer. Uh, and He will take away self and He will fill you full of all that is good and right. Uh, and it's, no, it's not an evil thing, it's not something that, to avoid, but it is a light to be drawn to. Um, and that's the message of the Gospel. So, uh, that doesn't change. And uh, it doesn't change uh, despite the different groups of people and, 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 and the way they feel about it, it just doesn't change. And I will say this as well, I have seen the other side of the coin, which is the power of the Gospel of Jesus Christ to change lives and to instil in people hope and to give them all that they were lacking. I have seen it dozens and dozens and dozens of times. I was very fortunate, I was in youth ministry, I was very fortunate, I was a preacher when I was younger, uh, and I have seen people converted, I have seen the life-transforming change, and I have seen people converted in the LGBT communities as well, and they will all tell you, this truly is the answer. This is the answer, so... My 14-year-old has accepted Jesus. But all the things from media, school, etc., make him confused. In such a situation, how can I encourage him to trust the word? Ooh, that's a that's such a huge question. Um, so the first thing I will say is, um, I think so. I think of my life as a kid and a teenager, and I look back at the journey I went on, and you can see so many situations. So many experiences and encounters where you think, wow, if that had gone wrong, I'd be in a very different place. Or that was a moment of testing, or that was a moment of temptation, or that was a wrong idea that got a hold of me. And you can look back over your life and you can see all of those things. And the truth is, I really believe now that the thing that carried me through more than anything else was actually the prayers of people who took an interest in me. Um, you know, I found out only recently, like my mum, she never told us to make our beds, never. And so we never did. And one okay, of the funny things... Okay, that's back to the housekeeping question. <laughs> I think we just hey, got I'll, the answer I'll to that one. I make it now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is, Dad actually said to her one time, why don't you get the kids to make the bed? And she said, because every time I walk into the room and make the bed, I remember to pray for them. And so I kneel down at the bed and I pray for them at school. And I had a praying mum. Uh, I really did. Uh, and I also had a lot of... I actually had an army of old folk who prayed for me growing up. Because we used to go to this, uh, this old people's home, this nursing home, at Norman Park in Brisbane. And my dad's a doctor, so he would go and do sort of free medical care for all of these residents... Uh, and he sort of became a bit of a specialist in geriatric care as a result of it. Uh, but the other thing that he did was he would wheel them all out of their rooms into the common area uh, and he'd do a devotion for, we would all wheel them out, and he'd do a devotion uh, just to, you know, brighten things up and, you know, teach them from the Bible and they're all Christian folk. But then he would get his kids, of which there was an army of us, uh, and uh, all my siblings were very talented musically. Um, it didn't, just didn't come down the line for some reason. <laughs> Uh, I've got talents in, in, in the voice area, but the, they would sing and perform and do songs and things, uh, but I would, uh, I would be put on a chair to either give a sermon or, because um, or, or, <laughs> I, I would always be reading, I, I got into the kings of the Old Testament, uh, and so I'd memorise all about their lives, um, and Dad would put me on the chair and I'd give a sermon on a king in the Old Testament for five minutes to these elderly folks. So they absolutely loved it, you know? It sounds a bit... It sounds a bit like child abuse or something, doesn't it? But uh, they absolutely loved it, and I just talked the hind leg off an iron pot while I was up there. And what happened was that all those elderly people prayed for me every single day for years. And I just think back, I think of so many things now, I think, I reckon someone was praying for me. I really do. And so I would say, 
actually, and, and, and I think that's why stories like Hannah are in the Bible. The, the power of a praying parent um, is, is huge. Start with that. The second thing is, and I'm probably going to go way past 10 past now, but another thing is that I've also learned in recent times was, was my parents deliberately made home the best place in the world for us kids. We really wanted to be there. Uh, and we knew that it was safe, we knew that it was happy, we knew that, you know, they weren't cranky and cantankerous, they weren't telling us, so, you know, they just, they, they, they were very gracious and they allowed us to be there. And that meant that, of course, we wanted our friends to come to our place uh, and we would do so many things from home. And that way, the influence of the home became extremely, the strongest thing on my life. Uh, and the influence, and also it meant that because I was present with and watching my parents, uh, I, 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 I really relied on them uh, in the sense that I trusted them, I asked them my questions, I went to them with my concerns, all this kind of stuff. And of course, my parents are wise, godly people, and so that influence on my life was very strong. Uh, so we were never alienated in any way, if I could put it that way. It was always like, we want to be here and we want to be with mum and dad. Um, and they were very careful about that. Uh, and the, th the truth is still that of all the influences on a child, whether it be school, uh, whether it be entertainment of various kinds, of all the influences, I still think it is definitely true that in a happy, good and secure home, the number one influence on the kid is going to be the home. Uh, and that was where all was at peace and all was well with the world and where we were shaped and formed. Somewhere in there, uh, I trust that there's uh, some answers to that question. It certainly is. Please thank Martin Niles, everybody.